Okay, well, I think, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. It's 12.03, just give me a second here so I can see my script. Uh, afternoon, everyone, and, and for some it's still morning. Walt, I think it's, uh, it's still morning where you are, but uh, glad to have everybody here. My name is Nick Lewandowski. I'm the Government Relations Director here at Wisconsin Farmers Union. Uh, been on staff now for just a little over two months, but uh, it's, it's good to have all of you join us here. Uh, thanks for joining uh, WFU's winter meeting series as we look closely at the challenges surrounding meat processing in Wisconsin, uh, but also on the federal level too, as, as we'll talk about here today, uh, and then determining possible solutions to those uh, challenges. Uh, today, as I said, we'll be talking about federal and state policy solutions with our three panelists. A uh, little bit about Wisconsin Farmers Union. We're a member-driven organization, uh, and we're committed to enhancing the quality of life for family farmers, rural communities, and all people through educational opportunities, cooperative endeavors, and civic engagement. And meat processing was selected as a special order of business by our membership, both in 2020 and now in 2021. Uh, so this has been a, a huge priority for us uh, for now going on two years. And as we examine this issue, we look at it through the lens of the Farmers Union Triangle, and many of you are familiar with that, but each side of the triangle has a different meaning, uh, one being education, one being cooperation, and one being legislation. So if you like what you hear today or throughout these sessions uh, over the next few months, we hope you'll consider joining Farmers Union, Wisconsin Farmers Union, or maybe Farmers Union in your state, and becoming an active member. If you don't live in Wisconsin, we can gladly connect you to a Farmers Union chapter in your state, or maybe Mike Strands can, can help with that on the national level. We're pleased to have the following panelists joining us today. Uh, Mike Strands is the Vice President of Advocacy at National Farmers Union based out in Washington, DC. Randy Romanski is the Secretary Designee of the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection, or DATCAP, as we know it here. He's based in Madison. And Walter Schweitzer is the president of Montana Farmers Union, uh, and their home base is in Great Falls, Montana. I want to do a quick uh, rundown of some housekeeping items, and then we'll get started. But uh, this event is being recorded. We'll share the recording on the WFU YouTube channel, so it's easy for you to listen again and to share with others. You'll be sent an email when the recording is uploaded. Uh, we're excited to hear from you about the questions you may have. You can ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And if you move your mouse around, uh, you'll notice that the Q&A button is down at the bottom there. And you can submit questions by clicking on that and then typing uh, in that box there. Uh, we know that meat processing is, is an issue affecting people across Wisconsin and, and across the country, as I said earlier. And we want to hear from you. We wanna collect as many short stories as possible from farmers and producers and processors so that we can help to share that full impact. You can do this by following the link in the chat uh, that Bobby is going to be sharing right now. And finally, you can learn more about processing and the work that WFU is doing on our website. That's at wisconsinfarmersunion.com slash processing. And Bobby's gonna drop that into the chat as well. So at this time, uh, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Each of them will get an opportunity to quickly introduce themselves. They'll spend a little bit of time talking to us. We're, we're allocating about 10 minutes to each of you. Uh, so, so please use that time. Uh, we'll use the first half of this uh, hour to uh, introduce yourselves and to talk uh, about your role in, in solving some of these challenges. And, uh, uh, they'll all speak first, so we'll just go down the line, starting with Mike, and then down to Randy, and then over to Walter, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions that we've prepared already, uh, and then we'll, if there's time, hopefully, we'll move over to questions from the from the crowd. So, uh, thank you so much, and uh, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike Strands. Thanks, Nick, and thanks to Wisconsin Farmers Union for the chance to uh, talk with you today about some of the federal policy issues related to meat inspection and the meat industry. Uh, as Nick said, I'm the Vice President of Advocacy for National Farmers Union, but I'm a native Wisconsinite from O'Connell Falls, Wisconsin, and uh, I've been in Washington for about 11 years now, uh, working for Farmers Union uh, and on Capitol Hill. 
and uh, used to work for Wisconsin Farmers Union too. So it's great to come back and to have this conversation today. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about the federal perspective on meat inspection policy. And over the last year, uh, because of the pandemic, Congress, the administration, the general public, and the media have had the closest look at the fragile but efficient state of our food supply, particularly in meat. Uh, like, time, like no other time, or at least in decades, decision makers saw and better understood the gravity and consequences of having a consolidated meat industry. Uh, for farmers union and for family farmers and for small scale meat processors, this isn't a new realization. Uh, even though uh, we've been working on this issue for a long time, either as something that represented a bottleneck in how we can market our livestock, or uh, a good example of the anti-competitive practices throughout much of agriculture, uh, we've identified this as a core problem for, and for a long time. So, however, in the course of just a few weeks last spring, uh, these longtime points of concern became big points of concern to people across the country and around the world. So we spent a lot of time at National Farmers Union spreading the message uh, back in March and April and May, and even until today, about how even as meat production has grown over the last several decades, thousands of small scale meat plants have gone out of business. Uh, so that only a, a few uh, large processing facilities process the vast majority of our meat in the US. Uh, for example, in beef, uh, just about 50 plants account for 98% of all beef processing nationally. Uh, these plants are owned by an even smaller number of companies. Uh, for example, in beef, only, uh, only four firms control about 85% of the beef market. Uh, through the pandemic, we've also seen some excellent research and reporting by the Food and Environment Reporting Network, uh, or FERN. They found that there have been just shy of 60,000 COVID-19 cases and nearly 300 deaths reported amongst workers in the meatpacking sector, oftentimes due to conditions at those plants, crowding, and a whole lot of other factors. So with those outbreaks at large processing facilities, coupled with dramatic shifts in consumer demand, uh, commercial red meat production dropped by 25% from March to May last year. For hogs, in that same time period, production fell by 30%. And then this last summer, as plants began to reopen, the glut of livestock couldn't all be brought to market. As so many of you have felt at home and in your communities, uh, creativity had to be the order of the day, and it remains so. And some custom or niche markets, like many of you have worked in, have boomed or have become overwhelmed, or maybe even both. So the challenge for this year and for the years to come is to make sure that these lessons that we learned and felt over the last year aren't forgotten. Uh, after all, like so many other parts of the economy and in our lives in general, the pandemic has made bad situations worse. So we need to keep sharing that message. Uh, but again, I wanted to thank Wisconsin Farmers Union for holding these meetings over the last few weeks and months. Um, and it's done a lot to educate people in federal policy as well. Just if uh, you get a question from a congressional staffer, you can say, go back and watch the December meetings from Wisconsin Farmers Union, and you can get a much clearer understanding of what's going on. Uh, because off, it is difficult to explain the structure of meat inspection uh, regulatory regimes uh, and how there's three levels of inspection, federal, state, and custom exempt. The different levels aren't necessarily ranked on effectiveness or rigor, but there's a lot of nuance along the way with plenty of exceptions and special cases. So I won't dive into that, but I just wanna say how much this has helped, these sessions have helped to educate people. So now that the 117th Congress is just about a month old now, uh, there's a lot of bills being discussed, developed and introduced to be uh, avenues to address the problems we've seen in the last year and long before that. Um, and actually some progress was made late last year too. But when we're thinking about federal meat inspection policy, uh, really there's three schools of thoughts on how to approach the changes. You could one, rebuild the whole system, two, shift the regulatory standards, or three, dedicate resources to build a more resilient system. Uh, so there's three different avenues there and I'm not gonna advocate for one over the other necessarily, but this is what people are looking for and considering. So on rebuilding the whole system, there have been calls to deregulate, then re-regulate uh, the meat inspection uh, regulatory regime. Uh, 
for example, last year, the Heritage Foundation held some events, and, uh, commissioned some studies that considered options for repealing the Wholesome Meat Act. Uh, and while there have been studies and far reaching proposals to consider how to do that, uh, it's pretty clear that the political will to do that is hard to find. And that would be a big lift and would take a long time. Uh, again, not saying that's right or wrong, but we're not gonna be able to start from scratch anytime soon. So that takes us to the second point or second uh, possible avenue, and that's to adjust the regulatory standards. This is a spot where there have been some uh, proposals that have come forward that gain some traction, but haven't yet been enacted or passed into law. Uh, one example is known as the New Markets for State Inspection Meat and Poultry Act. I'll call it the New Markets Bill, just to be short. Uh, its initial co-sponsors were two senators, Mike Rounds from South Dakota and Angus King from Maine. Uh, this bill has been around a while, uh, or at least the concept has. Uh, it was part of the debate for the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, it was discussed, but wasn't actually considered formally in the process and thus was not adopted. But the new markets bill would allow meat and poultry products inspected on the state level to be sold in interstate commerce. Uh, Senator Rounds from South Dakota noted that this wouldn't necessarily supplant the existing cooperative interstate shipment program that uh, about seven or eight states have, Wisconsin included, but uh, it would perhaps work with it. And uh, so there would be some workarounds there and it wouldn't necessarily supplant existing structures. Uh, but there have been some uh, criticism of it. Uh, some of the uh, food safety groups out there and consumer uh, organizations have pushed back on this uh, proposal. Some of those groups include the Consumer Federation of America, the National Consumers League, Food and Water Watch, others have uh, pushed back on this and uh, have cited it as a way that might not uh, allow for, or at least require, the same rigorous standards that federal inspection has. Now, some states counter that they have a stronger, uh, more in-depth regulatory structure as well. Wisconsin, Minnesota might be amongst them. But uh, so there's some uncertainty about that and some political uh, opposition to the new markets bill. Another idea about uh, working within the existing regulatory structure, but shifting it a bit, is known as the Prime Act, or Processing, Revival, and Interstate Meat, Ship, Interstate Meat Exemption Act. Uh, this was brought forward by Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky and Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine. Uh, they've been advocating for this for a couple of years. And the Prime Act would, exempt the, would extend the custom slaughter exemption to allow for meat and meat products processed at a custom slaughter facility to be sold within the state of slaughter to consumers, restaurants, hotels, grocery stores, and other establishments. Uh, so uh, I think Congresswoman Pingree put it well when she wrote in a letter to uh, Speaker Pelosi about this last year that, or two years ago, that she's not advocating for relaxing the standards that USDA has set, nor is seeking to diminish the critical work of USDA in maintaining quality and consumer safety. But instead, Congresswoman Pingree says, she's simply asking that they address the needs of communities in a way that supports them economically and morally during the pandemic. Uh, so there's some, some support there from uh, friendly members of Congress like Congresswoman Pingree. However, there's also political pushback uh, from the food safety groups again. And uh, in fact, Dr. Mary Hendrickson from the University of Missouri, uh, a noted uh, scholar on a lot of agriculture and rural issues has said that because no inspector is present as well as food safety concerns for the general public, there's limited sanitation oversight. Uh, and she instead cites that maybe we should work within the current regime of regulation and put more money into infrastructure to help small plants represent and uh, help out their regional markets. So that takes me to the third option, uh, dedicating resources to build a more resilient system. Uh, in the last year or so, funding has not been a, uh, has not been in shortage, let's say, at the federal level with stimulus packages uh, tallying up trillions of dollars in spending in the hopes of uh, establishing a more resilient rural economy and economy in general. Uh, there's two proposals that have caught a lot of attention. One is known as the Ramp Up Act. Uh, this was brought forward late last year and was actually enacted as part of the 2020 stimulus. Uh, it provides about $60 million to make facility upgrades 
and grants to existing meat and poultry processors to help them move from state inspection to federal inspection or custom to federal inspection. Uh, and it also works with USDA to report on ways to improve the cooperative interstate shipping program. And then just last night, the House Agriculture Committee uh, approved provisions uh, related to the next round of stimulus. Part of the bill they approved includes $100 million in overtime fee relief for small meat and poultry processors. Uh, so this is to uh, reimburse some of those plants uh, to help pay for their overtime costs for meat inspectors uh, on the federal level or through CIS. So that's, uh, that's one way that additional help is being provided to help diversify and make more resilient the, the meat inspection regime. So uh, I'd be happy to take questions later on. I appreciate the discussion here. Uh, but I would also want to reiterate that at the core of all this is the competition issues within the meat industry and that the lack of competition at a medium to large scale processing uh, scale uh, really holds back the market for uh, a lot of producers. And we should work to address those challenges on a larger market scale, but also to help build local and community uh, economies through making our small or very small plants uh, ready to tackle the influx of processing demand. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Nick. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And we look forward to some questions for you here in just a little bit. I'm gonna send it over now to uh, Secretary Designee of the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection here in Wisconsin, Randy Romanski. Randy. Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, happy to be joining you all today. Uh, it, and uh, really appreciate the uh, Farmers Union for uh, organizing the discussion. Uh, clearly, this is this is something of interest to, to all of us. Uh, I guess I'll just start off by saying, it, and this is uh, obvious, but meat processing is an important part of our state's agricultural economy. So we really appreciate the chance to talk a little bit more about how the Department of Ag Training and Consumer Protection serves as a resource to the industry and the continued investments we hope to see uh, made um, in its viability going forward. So I, I guess uh, I wanted to start by taking a look at where we are right now. Uh, I would say it was, and it's good timing to have me follow up with Mike because he's kind of given the lay of the land from the federal perspective. Uh, Wisconsin as, as one of the strongest uh, state meat inspection programs in the country. Uh, overall in Wisconsin, there's about 500 uh, meat processing facilities, uh, ranging in size from, you know, very, very large to very small. Um, there are about 200 federally inspected facilities in Wisconsin, about almost 250 state inspected facilities, and another 50 plus uh, custom exempt meat, in, meat establishments that are inspected by the state. So we're, you, we're strong, we're, it's a large program, and we're somewhat unique in some other states the program is either not as robust, or in some cases, a state program doesn't exist at all. Federal inspection is the only option that's out there in some of those areas. So I just wanted to walk through that as kind of a lay of the land here in Wisconsin. Clearly, the, the volume and the distribution of, of size of operations is a strength uh, here in Wisconsin. At DACA, our staff in the Bureau of Meat and Poultry Business uh, work to ensure that meat products produced here in Wisconsin and sold to consumers comply with the standards that have been set by the state and federal government to ensure safety, purity, wholesomeness. Uh, in fact, even in a state inspected plant, uh, all products have to meet or exceed standards set by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And while we're talking about our program, we Wisconsin also has a a strong and, and unique uh, CIS program, uh, Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program. We have state inspected facilities who've met the, the qualifications to ship their plant from a state inspected plant interstate. We've got about 20 facilities that meet that standard. So we've got a, we've got a robust program here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, as we saw with nearly every industry, COVID-19 had a, a, a dramatic effect on Wisconsin's meat industry. Mike, Mike walked through some of that. Uh, we saw unprecedented disruptions and bottlenecks across the meat supply chain. 
uh, in Wisconsin, we were we were fortunate to not encounter some of the issues other states did. Uh, we did not see mass euthanizations of market ready animals, uh, but clearly bottlenecks uh, were created because of some of the you know some of the plants going down and animals needing to find a place to to move. Um, on the production side, COVID-19 is just the latest in a series of challenges Wisconsin farmers have faced, uh, including uh, low commodity prices, difficult weather in, in recent times, and, and obviously trade disruptions. Um, so early on in the pandemic, uh, Governor Evers recognized the essential nature of our agriculture and, and food workforce. Um, he, uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about how federal dollars uh, have been used, could be used, but uh, in Wisconsin, Governor Evers did utilize federal CARES Act dollars to uh, invest in, in uh, response to the agriculture industry, including providing $50 million in, in uh, direct aid payments to over 15,000 farmers last year, including uh, from our smallest uh, farm operations to our largest. And we appreciate farmers uh, being part of those discussions. Uh, those, uh, uh, those payments went to dairy crop and livestock operations. Uh, the governor also allocated another 25 million of the Wisconsin Federal CARES Act funding toward helping food banks and other eligible nonprofits adapt their infrastructure to meet the challenges of COVID. And, purchase Wisconsin food products, including meat, for distribution to people in need. Um, in addition to, to those investments that the governor made, uh, the ACAP staff had to shift some of their responsibilities as well. Um, we pivoted to conduct our work virtually, uh, and uh, that included some food safety inspections. Now, critical in-person visits like slaughter inspection, pasteurization checks, those still occurred in person, but our staff conducted hundreds of phone and, and video calls with, uh, with uh, establishments and, and plants that we regulate. Uh, what we saw during that is our, uh, the meat processing facilities in Wisconsin, a lot of small Main Street state inspected plants uh, worked more hours, more days to accommodate more animals. Uh, so that's a credit to them uh, that they were doing that. It's also a credit to our staff because our our meat inspectors needed to be there in order for those facilities to be operating. Um, we also established some partnerships. We partnered with the Wisconsin Pork Association to launch a program called Passion for Pork that's designed to connect Wisconsin pork producers with local meat processors who are able to take on that additional capacity that we were talking about. Um, we uh, partner with the Wisconsin Grocers Association to create a searchable database to help connect local meat processing facility to local grocers to ensure protein could be available in their stores. Um, we've also uh, spent some time advocating for greater regulatory flexibility at the federal level in order to help our local Wisconsin meat processors expand their markets, including across state lines. Uh, flexibility is key. Uh, resources, as Mike was talking about, to invest in resiliency are key. Um, and the other thing I'll say is it's important that any any programmatic issues that any programmatic opportunities that might exist from the federal level, we like to make sure that it doesn't disadvantage uh, state inspected facility or state uh, state inspection programs, uh, so that there's investment opportunities across the board. Uh, we're proud of the work that our, our team at DACAP has done to be a resource to help uh, keep the meat supply chain flowing during the challenges of the pandemic. Uh, however, the, the long-term prosperity of our agriculture industry relies on resiliency, as Mike indicated, and the success of our food supply chain and rural communities. As a state, we need to bolster that agricultural infrastructure at the same time, we're training workers for the most needed positions from meat processing to food distribution. So as you may have heard, uh, Governor Evers offered a preview uh, last week of his uh, upcoming biennial budget proposal that's going to be released this coming Tuesday evening. As part of that budget, the governor uh, is proposing an unprecedented investment of over $43 million in Wisconsin agriculture. Now, that funding falls into I'm going to call it four buckets or categories. One of them 
is market development from locally to internationally. Uh, a second is uh, protecting our land and water resources. A third is investing in mental health resources, all of which are vitally important. But today we're talking about meat processing. So I wanna talk about that fourth bucket a little bit. And that's investing in Wisconsin's meat infrastructure, uh, meat processing infrastructure. So uh, the governor's budget is gonna to aim to bolster Wisconsin's livestock and meat processing industry in three ways. Start, starting out with uh, creating a meat processor grant program to target the needs of the meat industry. That's gonna incentivize innovation, expand Wisconsin's overall meat processing capacity, build out some of that infrastructure and facilities that might not have had the opportunity to do so. Uh, step two is if, if we're going to innovate, invest and modernize and expand those facilities, we have to make sure that there's uh, workforce available. So he's creating and funding a meat talent development program that's gonna specifically target meat industry workforce development and help spur uh, growth in Wisconsin's meat processing industry making sure that the industry has that uh, trained and talented uh, uh, crew of, of workers that are, are ready to help uh, expand operations, grow, grow uh, the opportunities for Wisconsin's uh, meat processors, whether they're just down the street from us on Main Street or uh, anywhere else across the state. Third, and this is an important step in the process, uh, the governor's also proposing, proposing adding uh, additional meat inspector positions at DATCAP. Uh, they ensure a safe, secure food supply um, as we see these investments by our meat processors. Uh, but uh, here's a key thing is as we see uh, our, uh, our state inspector facilities um, try to innovate and, and, uh, and accommodate additional animals, um, uh, we need to have our state inspectors there just to oversee that. We don't wanna have a lack of resources at that point, slowing down the industry. Um, so I guess that's a, I, I, we're really excited about the timing of this discussion and the timing of the governor's announcement. Uh, he's gonna introduce his budget uh, next week. So uh, this is the start of a long process. Uh, more details will come out during the governor's budget proposal next week, but we wanted to share this information because uh, this is a, an exciting opportunity to invest in the industry. Um, I, I've worked for the state of Wisconsin for 30 years and during that entire time, I don't think I've seen an investment of this size uh, in the industry like this. Um, and I guess I'll just close by saying, I think I think there's more that we, that we as the state uh, agree on than we disagree on. Uh, we're looking forward to working with the governor, the legislature, uh, organizations, uh, individuals in the state of Wisconsin in the coming months to move forward with this investment in Wisconsin meat processing and, and other areas of Wisconsin agriculture. So with that, I, I will again thank you for the opportunity to have me join this panel today. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the additional discussion. Thank you, Randy. And I think I shared this with uh, other WFU staff on Friday morning, but uh, that uh, announcement the other day was like Christmas in February. So uh, we were sure glad to see that and looking forward to working with all of you at DATCAP, the governor's office and the assembly and uh, moving that forward. So thanks again, Nick. We'll, we'll get back to you with a question or two here in a bit, but uh, let's send it over to Walter Schweitzer. Walter is the president of Montana Farmers Union. Go ahead, Walt. Well, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. You've got some some real horsepower on here that uh, that obviously has a lot of knowledge about the industry. You know, um, as everyone's already pointed out, the, this this COVID pandemic has put a microscope on our food supply chain. We found out it's broken. When 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 grocery stores are rationing meat, dairy products, and uh, produce. While livestock producers are euthanizing livestock, dumping milk down the drain and plowing in vegetables, that's a broken system. And you know, it, it's really a result of 60 years of a cheap food policy. Now this cheap food policy is not at all about supplying food at a reasonable price. It is about corporate control of the food dollar. 
You know, I, I fancy myself as a young farmer, but as you can see, I'm more of the average age of a farmer in Montana. And when I started farming, we processed 70% of our own food here in Montana. I, I could go to my local grocery store in my local community and our shelves were full of Montana food. Now I gotta drive a, an hour to get to a big box store chain to buy food that comes from, especially in the case of beef and pork, we have no idea where it comes from. And, um, and this has, has wreaked havoc. And, and it's really, the cheap food policy is about concentrating the control of the food dollar in the hands of few. Now they said it's in the name of efficiency. Well, well, really, it might have been about efficiency, but it came at the expense of resiliency. And that's what we found out in the last few months. And it's a broken system. A lot of what needs to be done to fix it is what Mike just talked about at the federal level. You know, this, this food inspection, the FSIS and FMIA, Food Safety Inspection Service and the Federal Meat Inspection Act. It's way more about protectionism rules for corporate monopolies, not about safe food. And it certainly has nothing whatsoever to do with food security. And that's what we need to do is get back to talking about food security. That's what's important here. I remember when I was a kid going to farmers union picnics and I listened to those old timers talking. You know what we need to have happen is what happened to consumers in World War I and World War II. When they went to the grocery store and found out the shelves were empty, then they started paying attention about where our food came from and how it got there. Well, that's, you know, there's really nothing good about coronavirus, but I'm kind of hoping some good things will come out of this whole pandemic. And, and one of those things is taking a deep look at our food supply and how we can make it more secure. And, and one of the ways we can make it more secure is to get back to a regional processing system. Like we had when I first started farming. We had a slaughter plant in every major city here in Montana. We had a, a flour mill and a bakery. We had home delivery milk. In just a few short years, and it seems like real short to me because it's my lifetime, but we have gone from feeding ourselves to struggling to feed ourselves. And, and so I really appreciate what you're doing here. It's what we need to do. We need to get back to focusing on regional processing, regional production. And, uh, and so we created here in Montana a, a, a program called Food Security For Us, F-O-R-Us.com, Food Security For Us. And, and it's really to educate consumers about cheap food policy, and what we really should have is food security. I think if the consumers realized that they were being manipulated by these corporate monopolies, they would be outraged. And so that's what we really need to do is educate these consumers. Now, if we're successful here and we can change the direction from cheap food to food security and get back to our regional processing, we've got a lot of catch up to do. You know, Montana, we here in Montana, we consume about 100,000 head a year, but we only have the capacity to process about 20,000 head. And so we need to rebuild our local meat processing system. And, and you know, these, these big corporate monopolies, they have everything on a, on a chain and they set it up on stations. And, and so a person working in one of these places that processes 10,000 head a day, a person working there knows that one cut really well. But if they had to go out and kill an animal, 
butcher it and package it, they wouldn't even know where to start. And so, you know, uh, over a year ago, uh, when I, um, about in December, November, December of 2019, I looked into uh, maybe starting a mobile slaughter unit for, for Montana Farmers Union, a cooperative. And, uh, and I priced it out and kind of was going through all of the, the, the ins and outs of it. But the thing that worried me the most and what I was struggling to do was find people to work in that butcher plant. They're just not out there anymore. And so I kind of parked that idea and then the pandemic hit. And I said, oh boy, our meat counters are empty in Montana. Come on now. And so I revisited this. Well, unfortunately, the companies that build these mobile slaughter units were now a year out from building one. And of course, their price went up about 50%. And I still had this problem of finding help to put in it. And so I participate in a lot of these different programs, food access, meat resiliency, food security. And on one of these panels, Mike Calicrate uh, was making a presentation and it was talking about public food markets. And in that presentation, I found out that he was upgrading his slaughter plant and that he was gonna be replacing his mobile slaughter unit that he's been using for a decade. So I reached out to him and I made a deal to buy it. And, uh, and at this same time, the state of Montana was taking some of those COVID dollars and investing it in our meat processing. And so there were grants available. So Montana Farmers Union, we applied for a grant and we got a grant to start this. I also, knowing that the biggest problem was finding help, reached out to our university systems to see if they'd be interested if I parked a mobile slaughter unit near them to work with us to develop a meat processing curriculum. Well, the couple universities that have programs, they're really more about the culinary meat. So they're working on how to cut the meat special after they've been killed and, and how to process them and make them into packages for retail sale. They were not so interested in killing an animal. In fact, the, the, the professor at Montana State University said, she doesn't even know if she could get past her student body because so many of them support PETA. That's here at Montana State. Now, uh, I did find the chancellor at MSU Northern up at Haver, who has developed a really good trade program where he trains plumbers, electricians, carpenters. He looked at this as another opportunity. Everyone could see we were lacking meat processing and we needed more. And, and everyone could see that we didn't have the workforce for it. So he was all about it. So we've been working with him to help develop a meat processing program at MSU Northern that starts at the harvest and goes all the way through to the retail. It'll be a one-year program and a four-year program so that we can train managers in these plants. Because you, know, you really need to know how to navigate the regulatory maze that's been created by the corporate monopolies to prevent local meat processing. And so they're gonna have a, a curriculum that teaches business management, regulatory management, and, um, and how to butcher. And, and so then we've also been working with a steering committee because I'm setting this meat processing unit up as a cooperative. It's gonna be owned by the producers here in Montana. And many of them are direct marketers, but you know who else is gonna be in this? The food banks. They're struggling now too, to find protein to be able to put on the shelves of their food banks. And, um, and you know, it's, I don't know how ridiculous it is in, in Wisconsin, but we have here in Montana, the custom exempt butchers cannot process livestock for the food bank. Now they can produce, they can process wild game for the food bank. You know what? They can even take roadkill and process it for the food bank but they can't process my cow? How insane is that? 
And, and this is regulatory regulations that are put in again, not about food safety, but protectionist rules. And, uh, and so the food banks are excited about this because we have many people who are wanting to donate livestock to the food banks, but they can't find any place to get it processed. I mean, right now we're over a year out to schedule a new kill in Montana. And so they are excited about this. And of course, processing hamburger is a good way to train a butcher. You know, um, I am so frustrated because even if we did get this co-op off the ground, unless we do something about corporate control of the food dollar, we're not gonna be successful, period. The fact that consumers cannot know where their beef or pork comes from, how can I compete when these big box stores can bring in scraps from Brazil and South America in general and mix them in with the burger and put it in a meat counter and say it's product of USA? How can I compete when these big retailers can lie, just flat out lie to the consumers? That needs to be addressed first and foremost. If we get country of origin labeling back, if we start to enforce the Sherman antitrust laws, if we reinstate the Packers decree, we're gonna need to be able to fill the void. We need more butchers and we need more butcher shops. And so what you're doing here in Wisconsin right now with this uh, panel is awesome. We need to do that in every state, every region. Thank you. Well, thank you, Walt. And, and uh, I don't know, but I, I just wish you'd get more passionate about this. <laughs> we, we're gonna call you Preacher Walt, I think, when it comes to this issue. You're, you, you hit the nail on, on every one of those. Uh, so we appreciate that. You're getting a lot of great comments from the, the crowd there. But since you brought up COOL, Country of Origin Labeling and Antitrust, I want to turn that back over uh, primarily to Mike, but anybody really on the panel that wants to speak to that. But Mike, uh, country of origin labeling came up in uh, soon to be Secretary Vilsack's uh, uh, confirmation hearing uh, in the Ag Committee the other day. Uh, he mentioned that as a possibility of, of readdressing that. You know, that came up the last time he was in that position in the Obama administration, but. Talk about that. You know, what are the possibilities of country of origin labeling coming back in this new Congress? Certainly, yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. And the uh, National Farmers Union supports country of origin labeling. We're looking for ways to get that back into effect. Of course, that you know, just in case, uh, as a reminder, we had country of origin labeling effectively in place from 2009 uh, until 2015. Uh, there were some changes in how it was enforced or put into effect, uh, depending on how the label was listed. And that was due to uh, appeals from other countries involved in the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization ultimately found that the way country of origin labeling was being run in the US uh, was counter to WTO uh, restrictions, and that other countries thus had the right to retaliate against the US as a punitive measure uh, because Canada and Mexico, namely, uh, determined that they were being unfairly and unjustly uh, affected by country of origin labeling. So once the, the threat of retaliation was around in 2015, USDA uh, or Congress acted to uh, repeal country of origin labeling. Uh, that's what happened in 2015. So since then, uh, Farmers Union has been looking for ways to bring this back up. We had some hope that the Trump administration might lead this, given a lot of the uh, talk about uh, made in America that didn't come to pass. Uh, so now last week or two weeks ago when S Secretary Vilsack's uh, hearing happened and he was open to, con to country of origin labeling but was curious on how WTO would factor in this and that's an unresolved question. Uh, we're part of the World Trade Organization and uh, it was up to Congress we could have uh, faced the retaliation from other countries uh, through trade uh, penalties 
and still had country of origin labeling, but it was determined to not be uh, acceptable by Congress when it was repealed. So uh, I think what we'll need to do in the coming weeks and months uh, is to regroup and figure out how we can address country of origin labeling and still and not run afoul of the WTO. Uh, Secretary Vilsack could play a role in that, but again, he, it's not just up to him. Uh, there's Congress may have to be involved in this, will likely need to be involved in it. And uh, even if uh, Secretary Vilsack wanted cool, uh, the issues as they are might make that very, very difficult. So we're looking to how to do this best, but uh, it's not clear at this point. I love Mike. And I'm really glad he's in Washington, D.C. fighting for us because he does it a little politically correct. I'm not so much. So here's the whole story that Mike's not telling you, is that the Packers in Canada and Mexico got Canada and Mexico to file a complaint with the WTO. Now, remember, these are the same Packers that we have here in the United States. The, the number, the biggest four are the same Packers in every major beef and pork producing country in the world. And they don't want to distinguish the difference between Brazilian burger and U.S. beef. So they filed this complaint, Canada and Mexico. And to begin with, this WTO complaint was on all foods. They were saying that it was unfair marketing practices for the U.S. to put on country of origin labeling because, you know, the American people in the United States, they would prefer to buy U.S. beef or U.S. products. Okay, that's kind of a stretch for me on unfair marketing, but, you know, because the majority of the panel and the WTO was from Canada and Mexico and other importing countries, they sided with the Packers in Mexico and Canada. Now, they narrowed this down from all foods to just meats. And while they were going through this whole process, um, National Farmers Union was working with the US trade negotiators to try to get the wording on the labels to satisfy everybody. And um, during this process, and again, they had this ruling that they could put retaliatory tariffs if the United States labeled meats with a country of origin. So then Congress, after the NCBA, which is the lobbyist for the Packers, and the stock growers and the Farm Bureau, which are lobbyists for the ag industry, uh, encouraged Congress to repeal COOL on beef and pork only because of this big, scary, retaliatory tariffs that were gonna just break the world if they happened. Now, a real quick point, they were allowed a billion dollars in tariffs if they wanted to implement them. Now, this was back in a time when that was a third rail, nobody really wanted to go to tariffs, um, but that was a billion dollars. Montana lost over $500 million the first year they repealed COOL. Just Montana alone. And we're not even nearly anywhere close to the largest beef producing state in the United States. So my argument, and I believe National Farmers Union's argument was, is that if they don't agree, then let's, let's see where it goes. Because first off, will Canada impose retaliatory tariffs? Because they actually have a lot more to lose in a tariff war than the United States. But we, Congress folded. They repealed it on beef and pork only. Now remember, Canada and Mexico still have this ruling today that they could impose retaliatory tariffs because we are labeling poultry, seafood. These are meats and lamb. These are meats. So if they wanted to, they could impose these retaliatory tariffs. So really, that's kind of what happened with COOL. Thank you, Walt. Appreciate that. It, it's good to have those two different perspectives. It's, it's great to have that. I'm going to move over to Randy real quick. Randy, you mentioned the governor's budget, and, and we're very thankful for that, uh, that influx of, of dollars, that wonderful investment. But I've got a question here from uh, one of our attendees asking, uh, and I know that there's not a lot of details yet, 
She's asking, will there be a mechanism to ensure that state investment benefits Wisconsin farmers? Will processors uh, that receive the investment dollars be obligated to serve in-state producers? Or could they potentially take state investment and then serve primarily out-of-state customers? Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, thanks for the question. And what I would say is you started in, in the right place, Nick. We don't have all the details yet. We'll, we'll see more about what happens in, uh, when the governor introduces his budget next week. But let me also just say one of the things that, that, uh, that I wanted to say, because I, I wanted to kind of take a step back from it and say, what can we all do? Well, number one, we can participate in these uh, in these great discussions like we're having. Like Walter, I like Mike too. So um, uh, it's it's good that we can that we can all learn from each other. But what I wanted to do is is focus on you know what the governor's proposed and what he's proposed is a look snapshot of what can we do, how can we make investments, and what are our opportunities. And what I would say is our opportunity is to build on the strengths of Wisconsin agriculture. Agriculture is a $104 billion industry in the state of Wisconsin. About 40 plus billion of that is meat and livestock. Uh, that's a good strength to draw on. We're really fortunate. I mentioned on the, on the front end, we have about 500 meat processors in the state of Wisconsin, ranging from that small plant just down the road to bigger operations. And, and so, what the governor's proposing is to invest in that infrastructure. So maybe I should take it, wind it back just a little bit to, to kind of, uh, I'll say paint the picture. It kind of already been painted already. But again, when I talk about building on the strengths, our state has, it, it, we've got these 500 meat processing facilities, but we also have this long history of artisan sausage making, cured meat, special to meat processing, and a number of smaller, state inspected meat processors producing locally sourced meats. And, and our number of facilities like that are among the highest in the country. So that's a strength that we can build from. So what did we, what did we see? As, as, we've, as each of the panelists have probably identified, COVID-19 accelerated and, and illustrated several growing trends in this industry It highlights back to my word here, opportunities for investment. What can we do? First, farmers turn to their local butcher for processing, but consumers also turn to their local processors for meat. There's been a trend toward increasing consumer demand for locally produced food. That, hap that was happening during the pandemic. Um, second, existing infrastructure was showing its age. Uh, many processors found themselves in need of additional space, uh, especially when some of those larger facilities went down and we started to see this bottleneck being created. But especially for cold storage and, and processors struggled to find enough skilled workers, which we've, we've been talking about to meet the increased demand. Uh, so because demand for locally processed meat has increased and capacity has not yet expanded in some of those smaller facilities, We've talked about this as long waits for farmers seeking an animal butchered at a local establishment. So what we need to do is invest in modern facilities, expanded infrastructure uh, that'll help ensure the continued movement of food through the supply chain and help position Wisconsin. I think I, I would continue uh, to position Wisconsin as a leading producer of artisan meats. We've got that infrastructure in place. And what the governor is proposing is to allow us to build on that. Now, talent development's key. I, I was taking some notes when Walter was talking there is can't find the workers. And uh, I saw that somebody popped up something in the in the link of the Morgan popped something up in the side link about how um, there's a program at Madison College that our staff helped to work through. Uh, we need to invest in that talent development. Again, Wisconsin has a tremendous opportunity before us. We've got uh, four-year uh, four-year colleges, some of who, who have uh, uh, programs that could help. Uh, the tech college system, uh, we have programs there that can help. We've got an opportunity to provide basically like a short course uh, for training uh, those who are interested. And again, we've got we've got the universities, uh, the the new uh, university meet uh, facility. So. 
um, we've got opportunities. I think the time is now to make those investments to build on that strength. And we've got, we've got that foundation. Um, so we're looking forward to, uh, uh, to the opportunities. We think the great opportunity for bipartisan support for what the governor's proposed. And, and we really appreciate the positive, uh, positive comments of Wisconsin Farmers Union thus far and, and uh, what the governor's proposed. And look forward to working with you on, on moving forward with that looking at those opportunities that we can do right here in Wisconsin to build on that local infrastructure that we have and make it even stronger, creating jobs in those local facilities and expanding even further the access to the local protein. Thanks, Randy. And, and you know, uh, Walter mentioned a little bit ago that they tapped into those CARES Act dollars uh, to help get their uh, mobile unit started up. Is that a possibility for us in Wisconsin? Could we still find a way to, to utilize some of those dollars or have we spent everything that we've been allocated when it comes to that? What, what's on the horizon for that if, if a possibility? Uh, the, the CARES Act funding that was available to Wisconsin has already been utilized. I, I, uh, I highlighted in the front end how the governor targeted funding uh, and again, appreciate the, the Farmers Union being part of those discussions, but uh, Governor Ewers was able to get $75 million out the door to Wisconsin's agriculture and food industry. Uh, something Walter referenced earlier was the, the food pantries. Um, we actually worked directly with uh, Wisconsin's food distribution network to make sure that 20 million of that funding was done to connect Wisconsin grown, grown and raised, grown, raised and processed food with those who are food insecure in Wisconsin, making that connection between producer and consumers. And it went through our food distribution network through our, our food banks in the state of Wisconsin. It's important that people know where their food comes from. And here in Wisconsin, we're, we're blessed to be able to, uh, to be surrounded by so much of what we need and consume on a daily basis, healthy, nutritious food. And so we've been trying to create, create those connections wherever possible. I know we've talked a lot about the governor's uh, proposed budget, and I saw something pop up in the link. Where can I find the governor's announcement? Nick, if we can get that to you, can you share it with this? Great. We'll share that information uh with you and I, I also wanted to let you know that um because it's it's come up a couple times but there uh uh there was a, a comment about well where do we where do we go how can we find things um how, how can we find ways to make that connection between locally sourced protein with locally uh, with uh, uh local uh retailers uh, so we've got a, a program for that, but also in cases where people have market ready animals and the, no processing appointments, there are long waits, we know that. But DACAP has put together a resource coordination center for Wisconsin livestock producers uh, who need to find help figuring out what to do with their animals. Uh, and I'm gonna give you contact information for that. Uh, but it's 608-224-4875. And Nick, I'll forward that link, uh, that information link to you as well, if you're willing to share that. Again, it's it's not an immediate, I call that number, I've got some place to go with my animal, but they're working to try and coordinate uh, that to the best of their ability. So just wanted to make sure that I made you aware of that. We'll share the information, Nick, and be happy to follow up with anybody who has questions. Great. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. Uh, and folks, we are at the one o'clock hour. Uh, so I know it's there's never enough time, unfortunately, for this. And, and we, we certainly do appreciate uh, everything that all three of our panelists have shared today. I'll just give a quick opportunity. Any, any closing remarks anybody wants to wrap up with before I uh, finish up with our last bit of house cleaning, housekeeping? It, it, I, I don't know how it is in Wisconsin, but I bet you Randy probably knows. Uh, here in Montana, uh, our universities, our schools, um, they can't process food anymore. They get these TV dinners that they prepare in, from Cisco and, and, and give it to our kids. And we, and we really don't know where that comes from. And we've been working with our universities and getting some traction to start feeding more local growing and raised food. But you know, that means they have to change their kitchens a little bit so they can process and cook food again. 
as long as Walter opened that door, I'm going to run through it. I'll do. I'll try and do it quickly. So you got me smiling because you've just touched on another thing that's in the governor's budget, which is promoting our farm to school, farm to fork program. We have a farm to school coordinator in Wisconsin. We don't have funding for a program yet. The governor is proposing funding for that farm to school program so we can build on some of that. So if Walter, thank you for doing that. I promise everybody, we didn't coordinate that in advance. Uh, but, the, <laughs> but the other thing that, that's also in the budget, and Nick, this is for another day, but I wanna say it as long as Walter brought it up, is a farm to, farm to fork program, which is kind of like a farm to institution program. So you can go to the local hospital or other uh, facilities like that. So you can get locally sourced products in those facilities. So I better stop there, otherwise it'll take up another hour about that program. But thanks Walter for opening that door. And thanks everybody uh, to, for having us on today. You bet. Thank you both. Mike, any last comments? Uh, two last things, uh, just to keep, two things to keep an eye out for. Uh, with the next round of stimulus funding coming up, there's a large chunk of money that is going to be made available to USDA to use for resiliency in the food system. And that can go be taken a lot of ways. There isn't a lot of parameters set on that. So the incoming USDA will have a, uh, and today's USDA will have a lot of a leeway about how to spend that. Uh, with some effort, with some outreach, uh, we can all work to help guide USDA to make sure that some of that is used in this uh, meat processing world. And if that's for additional education, additional capacity, improvements, training, uh, all that uh, can possibly be part of this next batch of stimulus. And then secondly, uh, look to the uh, upcoming hearings for the Department of Justice or for Attorney General uh, designate Merrick Garland. And if we're going to have antitrust enforcement and some changes in how uh, competition is enforced in agriculture, it's going to take some help from the Attorney General's office. So hopefully with work from Secretary to be Vilsack and Attorney General to be Garland, uh, we can pick up the ball from where it was left behind probably 10 years ago when we last had some effort on uh, anti-competitive anti practices in livestock. So those are two things to watch for, next round of stimulus and antitrust enforcement. Thank you, Mike, and I think we could do one whole webinar on that alone, and we may, we may yet, so uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, we'll keep you all updated through our partnership uh, through National Farmers Union and DATCAP uh, and other groups that we work with and collaborate on all of these details. Let's thank, uh, I want to thank on behalf of Wisconsin Farmers Union, our, our three panelists today for taking time, especially out of their noon hour, uh, for a couple of them anyway, uh, to, to join us and uh, thank them for that. Uh, if you like what you heard today and are not already a member, we hope you'll join Wisconsin Farmers Union. We're approaching this from all angles of the Farmers Union Triangle, like I said earlier, education, cooperation, and legislation. And just know we can make a greater change when people come together and work together. So please join us uh, today at that link in the chat. Uh, to register for the rest of the winter Meet Ing series, where we will be looking at solutions along with a number of other exciting events, please visit our website as well. That'll be dropped in the chat. Also, we'd like to remind you to share your short snapshot story of processing. All of these links are located in the chat. Thanks again to our panelists and to everybody who joined us today. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation with you during the rest of our series. Uh, and another reminder that WFU members are eligible for scholarships to that artisanal modern meat butchery program uh, that was mentioned at Madison College. And you can contact uh, WFU staff member, Diane Thierry for that. So thanks again, we'll get this recording up on our YouTube page here after a while, uh, you'll get an email on that. And for those that we didn't get to your question, we will lift those out of the chat and we'll try to uh, target those to the panelists uh, that we need to and get those answers back to you as soon as we can. So take care, stay safe, stay warm, and uh, we'll talk again soon.